Have you ever seen a movie that pissed you off so badly you make a whole YouTube channel just to roast it? That's me with Mulan 2020. Mulan brought me here. And now here are the things that must be said. First of all, if you didn't know, the majority of the production staff on this movie are white. A white director, a white costume designer, and four white screenwriters. And yes, it shows. It's filled with like European fantasy stuff like witches, dark magic, and duels to the death, and interpreted traditional Chinese concepts in a way that only showed a surface-level understanding. So the story starts off with Mulan's dad, Hua Zhou, telling Mulan's story to their ancestors. I mean... Okay, you can already feel that they fully intend on making this movie seem Asian by throwing a bunch of words around like ancestors, honor, family. And anyway, Mulan is introduced as a girl who already enjoys training to fight. This is an immediate departure from the ballad Disney claims to be trying to adapt because in the ballad, Mulan starts off sighing at a weaving loom. She was a very typical woman of her time. But it's her determination to save her father that drives her to transcend her abilities and become a great warrior. In this movie, with Mulan starting off as brave and powerful, it doesn't leave much room for character development. And she doesn't end up getting any. And at this point in the movie, her dad is all, If you had a daughter whose chi was this powerful, could you tell her that only a son could wield chi? This was the part that really gave me pause. And it's like one minute into the movie. What is chi? It's life energy. It flows through everyone, not just boys. It's the basis of acupuncture. In traditional Chinese medicine, it flows through the human body in a network of meridians. Acupuncture is when you stick needles in those meridians to manipulate someone's qi flow. Yes, qi is a common buzzword in wuxia stories, or what white people call martial art movies, which are based in the Taoist belief that you can gain supernatural abilities by using qi, but you do it by cultivating that qi. That's a word this movie could have used to make it feel more right, but it didn't. Then the camera pans to where Mulan lives, a distinctly southern Chinese tulo, why is this a problem? Mulan is an iconic northern Chinese tale. She lived in an era called the Northern and Southern Dynasties, which meant China was split in two back then. The emperor of a northern dynasty would not go to the southern dynasty to conscript troops. This is an example of Disney getting facts wrong solely for the pretty aesthetic. Because Tulo are pretty and they like, they look very exotic, I guess. In the Tulo, little Mulan chases a chicken onto a roof and falls, but does a bunch of sweet maneuvers and lands on her feet, to the astonishment of everyone. Again, she's established as having an impressive ability right in childhood. Her mom becomes worried that because of these abilities, Mulan won't find a husband because people will call her a witch. That's just like, not how women are demonized in... Chinese culture, like, more likely she'd be called an evil spirit, especially a fox spirit, Hu Li Jing, or some kind of demon. The dad then comes outside and tells Mulan that they have a statue of a phoenix in front of their ancestral shrine because it's the emissary of their ancestors. Personally, I haven't heard of anyone whose family has, like, an emissary for their ancestors. What ancestors do in Chinese culture is send your dreams. This is called Tuo Meng, and they ask you to do, like, just weird shit. <laughs> Mulan's like, oh no, then it's super bad that I broke her during my chicken chasing. And the dad is like, nah, phoenixes rise from the ashes. This isn't a huge problem because eastern phoenixes and western phoenixes have gotten so muddled and confused with each other that even like native Chinese people don't like, they mix it up too. But I have to point out that traditionally Chinese phoenixes don't do the whole rise from ashes thing. They're just there to look beautiful and graceful and to be a good omen to the empire when they're seen. Her dad goes all, your chi is strong, Mulan, but chi is for warriors, not daughters. Once again, completely misunderstanding what chi is. Chi is not the force. It's not this mystical oriental force. It's basically another physiological thing, like blood. Would you say blood is for warriors, not daughters? No, you wouldn't. Her dad also tells Mulan it's time to hide her gift away. Hmm, so they gave Mulan a superpower. They made her Asian Elsa. In my opinion, that immediately takes away a huge part of what makes Mulan such a great character because Mulan is not a character who was born great. She works for that and that's a very like Eastern story thing. The protagonists of Eastern stories, they work hard for their abilities. Then the title card appears and the camera goes to the Silk Road in Northwest China. A Silk Road trader comes across the witch played by famous Chinese actress Gong Li. She can step on. Now, The Witch is actually a character that gave me pause way back when the trailer dropped because China doesn't have witches. 
Witch is such a charged word and evokes such a specific idea that it's confusing when you use it in a Chinese context because the specific idea doesn't exist in Chinese culture. Yet this movie went with the common Western ideal of witch. A woman who can do magic and is ostracized by society because of it. Now there are women in ancient China who can do magic, like shamanesses, soothsayers, but those women are respected and generally hold high positions in the court. And there are women who are criminalized for using magic, such as like a court lady using a voodoo doll against one of her rival concubines. It happens all the time. But their crime is trying to harm someone, not doing magic in general. There's no persecution that happens specifically because you are a woman and you're using magic. Honestly, there's an easy fix to the witch's entire character. Don't make her human, make her a bird spirit instead. A big thing in Chinese myth is the spirit of animals or even inanimate objects cultivating their way into taking human form. That she would be persecuted for because, like, she's not human. One fix and her character would have made so much more sense. She even has the existing abilities of a spirit. Possession, shape-shifting, she's got it. This is why Disney shipped is hired a Chinese screenwriter because they could have just changed some words in their script and not look like other clowns. Anyway, movie! The possessed traitor goes to what looks like a western Chinese garrison city. I'll give credit where credit is due. They got the general look right. Most cities in ancient China were walled and you had to go through a guarded gate like that to get in. And then the Rorans arrive! This is where they try to be more accurate to the original ballad than the cartoon. In the cartoon, they used Huns, inaccurate and racist. Rorans are indeed the correct group of nomadic people that Mulan would have fought. But, fun fact, Mulan is most likely from the Northern Wei Dynasty, which is established by another nomadic people, the Xianbei. The ballad even refers to her emperor as the Great Khan. Anyway, the soldiers at the gate shoot an arrow at the Roran leader. He catches it with his bare hand, then shoots it back at the city, which is a signal for the witch to reveal her true form. Now, it's unclear if she possessed the Silk Road traitor or, like, took on his appearance. Very unclear. But she takes down some soldiers from the inside, and then the rest of the Roran scurry straight up the wall. Now, I've seen some complaints about this part. It doesn't deserve it. Scaling walls is a common trope in wuxia media. At this point, I've accepted that the movie is not historical fiction like originally promised. It's historical fantasy, which is fine. I don't mind supernatural elements in a retelling. It happens all the time in great Chinese literature. Half of great Chinese literature is just fantasy fanfiction of historical events. My problem is that many of the supernatural elements in this did not feel Chinese. Anyway, the Rowans take the city and then the witch takes possession of a soldier to sneak into the imperial city, which is clearly modeled after Chang'an or Xi'an as it's now called, the ancient capital of China. You can tell by the Great Wild Goose Pagoda lookalikes in the background, that's a thousand year old building that you can still visit in Xi'an. This shot is accurate. What's not accurate is what's happening in the city. This shot. This is the main stairs of the palace. I even know exactly where it's shot. The palace of the king of Qing and Hun Dian. China loves its period drama so much and they made a whole city that's like a replica of an ancient Chinese city just to shoot dramas in. In ancient China, these fancy court ladies wouldn't just be hanging out with officials on these stairs. This is a solemn place, especially when there's like an imperial meeting going on right behind them in the Great Hall, that building above the stairs. In the meeting, the Chancellor reports that the Rohans have taken six northern garrisons in a coordinated attack and everyone was slaughtered. Except for that one soldier. Before the Chancellor and the Emperor finish their discussion, the soldier cuts them off to say his report, which felt iffy to me because a normal soldier would never do that. They would never cut an emperor off. It would have felt more natural for the emperor to ask him to speak. The soldier, which is actually the witch in disguise, reports that the Rohan and their leader, Bori Khan, fights alongside a woman whose chi is beyond imagining. Again, this is like saying her blood is beyond imagining. What would feel more natural here is to talk about the way she uses her chi, not her chi itself. Her abilities are beyond imagining. There. Two words. And it would have even made more sense to a non-Chinese audience. Then the emperor is like, there is no place for witches in this kingdom. And also that they are not afraid of dark magic and will destroy this Roran army and their witch. It's so something straight out of a European fantasy. But it leads to the emperor issuing that infamous decree that demands one man out of every family to join the army. By the way, the emperor is played by Jet Li. <laughs> Did you recognize him? I didn't. I didn't feel like the whole movie. Jet Li, what happened to you? Why did Disney make you ugly? Or did, did you just get ugly? Oh my god. <laughs> so it cuts to the streets of the capital where the soldier shifts into the witch, then shifts into a bird. 
So it is shape-shifting then? I don't know, not possession? It's it's so unclear. So she flies all the way to the Rorank camp, which is clearly inspired by Mongolian yurts. She tells the, for some reason, half-naked Bori Khan about the army being assembled, and he's like, you have proven useful, witch. This pisses her off. And she's like, not witch. Warrior. And declares that she could tear him to pieces before she blinks. This line, this line is important. This line is important, and yet the script forgets about it, and leads to the most infuriating scene of the entire movie. You'll see. Bori Khan says that she wouldn't hurt him because what she really wants is to be accepted and belong somewhere where her powers wouldn't be vilified. Turns out she was exiled to the desert for being a witch. Alright, I guess. But his logic is that once they take over China, then she can make sure she's accepted. Okay. So why can't she use her incredible power to take the throne for herself? And don't tell me a woman can't be emperor. Wu Zetian did it. She'd be laughing at you from Chinese hell. After this conversation, it cuts to grown up Mulan. Yay. Played by Chinese American police brutality supporter Liu Yifei. Yay. While she's riding a horse, she spots two rabbits running beside her. She goes home and tells her family about this, theorizing that one rabbit was male and the other was female. But you can't really tell when they're running that fast. This is a reference to the final lines of the Ballad of Mulan, which talks about how male and female rabbits can be identified by their facial features, but when they're running side by side, you can't tell anymore. So, Mulan forcefully gendering the rabbits anyway defeats the entire point of the line and makes for a very clumsy reference. If they wanted to do it right, they should have had her meet the rabbits while they're grazing on the ground and be like, oh, you're a boy and you're a girl, and then they all run off and she realizes she can't tell anymore. That's the point of the line. Mulan's mom cuts her very exciting story off to tell her that the matchmaker has found her an auspicious match. Honestly, this is the only part of the script that feels Chinese. It's very your Asian mom trying to introduce you to some son of her co-worker. It, it's very that. It's got that energy. Mulan begrudgingly accepts and then it cuts to a very YouTube DIY montage sequence of her getting a makeover with an instrumental of Bring Honor to Us All playing. Now the makeup elements that get put on her are historically accurate. I have some infographics of them on my Instagram, I'll link them below. But it doesn't change that they interpreted these elements in like the ugliest possible way. There are ways to do this makeup style that wouldn't make someone look like a clown. I know they did this for comedic effect, but it doesn't sit right with me that they chose to exaggerate traditional Chinese makeup to a super ugly degree for a cheap joke. A joke that's not even funny. There are like no moments in this movie that make you laugh. And then the matchmaker does this whole sequence that's clearly only in this movie for trailer purposes. Like, oh, elegant, refined. These are the qualities we see in Mulan. The change from the cartoon sequence is that here, it's actually Mulan's sister that ruins it because she gets freaked out by a spider. Mulan does some Spider-Man 1 cafeteria scene maneuvers to catch the falling tea set, but her hair unravels and she falls anyway and the tea set is shattered. And for some reason she is blamed for this fiasco instead of her sister? Okay. <laughs> Also in the background of this shot, oh my god. So red couplets are something put beside doors in Chinese culture that celebrate the New Year's, but they have specific rules. And this couplet does not meet those rules. The lines are even from literature written several centuries after this era. It basically says, may all lovers in the world become great couples in the end, and may all couples in the world all be earnest lovers. In Chinese, these lines do not make a good couplet. So the Hua family is walking through the Tulo in shame when, suddenly, the imperial messenger shows up and announces the conscription. Then comes a sequence of everyone knowing the dad is too old and frail to fight, but the dad is too stubborn to give up. So Mulan sneaks off into the night with his armor and sword. A sword that has, I shit you not, the FBI motto on it. I just don't believe that it's a coincidence when it's the same three things in the exact sequence. Loyal, brave, and true versus fidelity, bravery, and integrity, they're literally synonyms of each other. Also, a Chinese person wouldn't just have three random characters on their sword. That is some white person tattoo nonsense. It would be the sword owner's name, or at least a full phrase that made sense. And by the way, there is no emotional impact to this decision scene. She just leaves, and then her family discovers this in the morning, and they're immediately like, okay, we have to keep quiet about this, or she's dead, and we're all dead. That's it. That's it. Oh, and there's no haircut scene, and if you're wondering why that is, it's because the original in the cartoon was historically inaccurate. 
Men kept their hair as long as women back then because in Confucian beliefs, your body is a gift from your parents and you have no right to damage any part of it. Like, people back then even kept all their nails in a box if they cut them. And beards technically couldn't be shaved too, so all those clean-shaven pretty boys you see in sea dramas? Not accurate. Mulan rides across some vast landscapes with apparently only a supply of apples, which did not exist in China back in the Northern Wei Dynasty, but it's a minor, this is a minor complaint. She ends up in a canyon where she sees a phoenix flying by. People have complained about this phoenix not being the right color or something, it's like hot pink, what, whatever. Honestly, this is like not even remotely an important issue that needs to be addressed. I don't care about the phoenix, whatever, it's whatever for me. I think it leads her to the training camp because she mentioned being lost before. In the camp, Cricket is a human character now. His mother says he was born under an auspicious moon. I have never heard a Chinese mother say that. Some commotion happens and it causes Mulan to be knocked over by a hot guy who teases her. And in her attempt to channel toxic masculinity, she draws her sword on him. He draws his sword too, but then their fight is interrupted by Donnie Yen. At night, Mulan finds that she now has to deal with sharing a tent with dozens of half-naked men. But she gets around the bathing issue by, well, they, they call it showering in this for some reason. But she gets around that issue by volunteering for night guard duty. Then comes the training montage. It comes with no iconic song and is therefore boring as hell to watch. You remember that scene in the cartoon where she figures out how to climb the pole using only the weights? Yeah, everybody remembers that scene because it showed why she was cut out to be a great warrior even so she like may not have been as physically strong as the men. Here, there's no meaningful struggle. It doesn't show Mulan bonding with the others in an effective way, except, well, except there's a scene that's a piss poor adaptation of um, the a girl worth fighting for scene. And in this movie, it's just straight up uncomfortable because it's, it's just a bunch of guys blandly objectifying women. Then comes a sparring scene where Mulan defeats her friend, acquaintance-ish person, Hong Hui, with her mystical superpowers. She berates herself Elsa style for showing her chi, which makes no sense because if she's disguising herself as a man, then showing her chi would not be a problem. Then everyone comes in to congratulate her for being badass, but also to tell her that she literally stinks because she hasn't taken a bath since she got here. So she goes to the lake to take a bath, but Hong Hui rudely tries to join her. Um, he's clearly taking the place of Shang from the cartoon and has some like romantic-ish tension with her. But, yeah, I think it's implied that he realizes she's a woman, but there's no real confirmation and then there's, there's no real bond between them either. There's just, there's just no emotion in this movie, oh my god. Then it cuts to a meeting between the 12 Roran tribes whose members resent that they're relying on a witch. <laughs> Which begs the question of why the hell is she relying on them to find her place then? They, like, they don't even accept her. You make plans to destroy another garrison, then it cuts back to the training camp where Donnie Yen calls Mulan for a private meeting and says he thinks she's hiding something. But plot twist, that something is her powerful chi. He's like, why are you hiding it? And she's like, damn, I don't know, when I'm in boy mode now, I can do whatever I want. So then there's another montage with a voiceover of Donnie Yen explaining chi in a way that feels slightly more accurate. Like, he admits that it flows in everyone, but it still has some weird wording that could be easily fixed. Like, he says, only the most true will connect deeply to his chi. First of all, it would be better phrased as, can cultivate their chi. And second, so you have to be honest to yourself to cultivate your chi? I've never heard that. It's always hard work. It's hard work that matters when you're cultivating chi. During the montage, another commander teaches them about how a great warrior can turn disadvantage to advantage and how four ounces can move a thousand pounds, which is a popular martial arts saying in China, but it just sounds so weird translated into English because it's translated very literally, and the original in Chinese is like, it sounds like more poetic than this. God. So because the Rorans keep taking more garrisons, the training class de gets deployed ahead of schedule. They come across the remains of a battlefield, and it's so disappointing because it completely lacks the emotional impact of the scene in the cartoon. That cartoon transition from that silly, like, um, a girl with, worth fighting for a scene, to the harrowing, massacred village, that's one of the, like, best cinematic transitions ever, just because it was such a great moment that showcased how, like, there truly were just boys who had no idea about the horrors of war, and then suddenly they're forced to confront it. In this movie, I felt nothing. <laughs> Nothing upon seeing all those dead bodies. This is on par with when I went to see The Lion King live action in theaters, and then I felt nothing seeing Mufasa die. This is very bad. Spoilers, sorry. 
Then comes a clash between the army and the Rorans. It looks so pathetic. Like the most people they could get was like four random buses of people. This cost 200 million dollars and yet I've seen C dramas with a fraction of that budget stretched across like 70 episodes and they have better war scenes than this movie. Borikon retreats immediately after getting showered with arrows and then the commander orders the left flank to charge. And the left flank is apparently, I, I counted, 10 people! They made 10 people go chase Bori Khan, the leader of this tribe that they're struggling to fight. Nine of these 10 people obviously get decimated, and the 10th is Mulan, who can't die because she's the protagonist. She decides to keep pursuing them anyway and ends up running into the enemy witch. Who's all, hmm, you're lying to yourself and it's poisoning your chi. I have, I have said enough about Chi, let's move on. <laughs> so Mulan passes out for a bit while the main battle rages on, and then she wakes up, stares at the FBI model on her sword, and she decides to shed her father's armor, the thing that's protecting all of her vital organs from harm, and she loosens her long hair so it's free to whip all in her face while she's trying to fight. It makes absolutely no logical sense. <laughs> They could have just shown her taking off her binder on her under her armor. She she didn't need to let go of her father's probably very precious and expensive armor. There are better ways to do this reveal. If only there was a good template to reference. If only. So she comes back to the battle in her very impractical getup, starts doing backflips on her horse. Which freaks the Rorans out, I'd be freaked out too. And they run from her because she's a witch. Their own witch turns into several swarms of birds to drive the Imperial soldiers into huddling under their shields. And then the Rohans destroy whole huddles using stone throwing machines. Some people have said that nomads shouldn't have machines like this. Uh, I don't care. I'm not a war nerd. I'm not getting into this. I got more shit to s I got more shit to dissect. <laughs> but Mulan gets the genius plan of, of triggering an avalanche to bury the Rohans. She picks up several helmets and makes it seem like some Imperial soldiers have crept up behind the Rorans, so they send a flaming boulder at the snowy ridge. Somehow, she outruns this avalanche, while the Roran and what appears to be a considerable amount of her own comrades don't. How fast is her horse? After the battle ends, Mulan walks up to her comrades like, Sorry, I'm a girl, feel free to execute me if you want for this horrible betrayal. Man, that's, that, that's so empowering. She gets expelled according to army laws instead. While she goes off to cry on some barren mountains about this, the enemy witch appears before her and tries to convince her to join her because she relates to Mulan's struggle. The witch like straight up tells her how Bori Khan retreating was a fake out and his forces are actually heading to the capital. Mulan's like, I know my place. Actual line. It is my duty to fight for the kingdom and protect the emperor. Man, so empowering. Mulan immediately heads back to the military base and tells the army about Bori Khan's plans. Donnie Yen is like, no, I won't listen to someone whose very existence is a lie. Then Hong Hui, the, the love interest kind of dude, is like, you would believe Hua Jun. Why would you not believe Hua Mulan? And then everyone else joins in like, I believe Hua Mulan. I believe Hua Mulan. I believe Hua Mulan. And so Donnie Yen, who was ready to execute her like 10 seconds ago, is all, all right, you will lead us to the Imperial City. Meanwhile, in the Imperial City, a squad of about like a dozen Rorad in very conspicuous ninja clothes sneak very conspicuously across the rooftops. The witch takes the body oh, of the Chancellor and claims to the Emperor that Bori Khan wants to duel him at the construction site of a new palace. The Emperor accepts. First of all, a duel between heads of state. Not a thing in China. Not a thing. Secondly, the writers have clearly never seen a sea drama because if they have, they know that a Chinese emperor can't even breathe differently without a whole gaggle of Confucian scholars being like, No, oh, your majesty! Think thrice, don't do this! <laughs> so then the witch disguised as the chancellor gives fake orders to assemble literally every guard in the city to a single courtyard. Somehow, nobody dares to seriously question this order or refuse it. They basically just wave it away as, oh, you're gonna question the emperor? No. <laughs> and 
It's so much that when Mulan and her battalion arrives, they walk straight into the capital and they don't see a single person in view. <laughs> when they get to the courtyard, it turns out that every guard in the city comes down to like 150-ish people. Do the writers have any idea how big cities in ancient China were? Especially the capital? They have no excuse because they did film in China, so there are like so many extras available if they wanted to fill that city and give it a more realistic sense of scale. Of course, the minute Mulan's battalion arrives, the Rorans close off the courtyard and attack the soldiers that assembled for some reason. Meanwhile, the dumbass emperor actually rides to the new palace construction site like the dumbass he is. And within half a second, archers take out the few personal guards he took with them, and he starts doing benchy kung fu to fight back. When Borikan shows himself, the emperor is all, How did you convince my chancellor to betray me? <sighs> Never mind that, like, he was the one who willingly agreed to this dumbass duel request. So, like the good Disney villain that he is, Bori Khan captures the Emperor using an overly complicated maneuver involving arrows and rope that gather into a net. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mulan's comrades slow down the Rowan in the city so she can rush to find the Emperor. In the throne room, though, she finds the witch instead. Who looks so right sitting on that throne? You know, I would have forgiven like all of this movie's sins if they had dared to make the witch like take the throne as a symbol, as an ultimate symbol of toppling the patriarchy. She has the power to kill both the Emperor and Bori Khan. Before they even blink, as she says. But no, we can't have nice things. Mulan tells the witch to join her on the noble path, because apparently everything will magically turn out okay if you just out yourself to your oppressors. The witch is like, no, it's too late for me, and turns into her bird form to fly out. Mulan chases her across the capital's rooftops. Here they didn't even bother showing a few shots of civilians looking up at her, so it just feels like the capital is empty and there are like 12 people in it. Back at the construction site, Bori Khan lights up a bunch of furnaces with the intention of burning the emperor alive. Instead of just killing him for some reason. They got it. Yeah, he has to. He has to delay it till Mulan makes him there. Oh my god, he's he's such he's such a devoted villain. In the middle of his villain speech, the witch shows up and is all, The attack is meeting a fierce resistance from a woman leads the army. A woman from a small village. Mulan arrives then and Bori Khan shoots an arrow at her. Now, in the single most baffling moment of the movie, instead of obliterating Bori Khan before he can blink like she, like she said she could, the witch dives down and takes the arrow in Mulan's place. And then she dies. All that power and she just dies of self-sacrifice. This is not empowering. A woman sacrificing herself is, is like the least empowering thing you can make a female character do. I find it like outright offensive. And apparently, apparently, Bori Khan only has this one arrow because Mulan heads into the construction site no problem. She and Bori Khan have a fight in the rafters that I don't care about because you know what, I'm still mad at the witch dying like that. At one point, Mulan loses her FBI sword to the furnaces, and the Emperor tells her to rise up like a phoenix to fight for the kingdom and its people. <laughs> the actual phoenix appears behind Mulan, and she knocks Bori Khan to the bottom of the construction site and frees the Emperor. Bori Khan's not dead. He shoots an arrow at them, which the Emperor catches with his bare hand. And then Bori Khan makes the most memeable face in the entire movie. Oh my god, it's so good. And then the Emperor throws the arrow in the air, and Mulan kicks it. Kicks it. Into Bori Khan, killing him. I don't understand this movie's obsession with Mulan kicking things. Especially arrows. Why? <laughs> then it cuts to the battle in the city. All of Mulan's comrades have conveniently survived. So, all the villains die and all the heroes survive. Great. Excellent. And then it cuts to the Imperial City, celebrating the victory. Mulan is, for some reason, presented in the court, in the presence of both 
the officials and the court ladies in the open, which would never happen. The cartoon Mulan's voice actress, um, Wen Ming Na, he, she makes a cameo, and I feel so bad because they put her in such an ugly, cheap looking dress. The Emperor offers Mulan a position in his Imperial Guard, but Mulan chooses to go home instead. Which is how the ballot ended, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. As Mulan leaves the Imperial City, the pseudo-love interest dude has a moment with her, uh, but they don't kiss or anything, which thank god. She goes home, it's supposed to be emotional, but it's not emotional because the movie did a terrible job of building up her bond with her family. Her battalion shows up hot on her heels, which- how does she not see them behind her? Like, five seconds behind her. And they present her with a new FBI sword. Yay. Oh, but this one, instead of the three FBI virtues, it has a fourth virtue. Xiao, filial piety, or devotion to family, as this uh, movie translates it. Great. Thankfully, the movie ends on the battalion asking her to reconsider the Emperor's offer. And she smiles in a suggestion that, like, she's gonna take it this time. But good. She didn't- she doesn't have to give up her prestigious opportunities to, for her family, god. You can have both. So, I went into this movie expecting it to be bad just because like I was on Twitter and then people were like, oh my god, Mulan. So like, I, I was expecting it to not be good, but still it was like so much worse. Not just because- like, even if you push aside all of the weird, inaccurate Chinese cultural details, it's just a terrible movie with no eternal logic and no emotional moments whatsoever. No emotional moments, no funny moments, and like, ugh, nothing is earned, no character arc, just uh So like, why is it a problem for white people to write a story that's like so deeply rooted in, in an underrepresented culture? Well, they put their weird orientalist interpretations on things and the story just doesn't end up feeling familiar to people of that actual culture. Which I find, yeah, this movie was just disrespectful. And you know what, Peak Hollywood is the costume designer, apparently Disney paid for her to travel around Europe in the museums with the looted Chinese artifacts and then also like she traveled around China for several weeks to soak up the culture. And they could have just hired someone who grew up in that culture. Who doesn't need to be like sent on to sent on trips. It's like they're trying to make things more difficult for themselves. So why does it matter that this movie isn't some like documentary of um, ancient China? Isn't it just a kids movie? Well, it is a kids movie that fails to do the job it promised to do, which is to make a faithful adaptation of the Ballad of Mulan. It's very clear that they just like threw a western fantasy story onto a aesthetically Chinese world to go for that like sweet sweet Chinese box office because honestly like money is the only thing Disney cares about it's it's very clear so they it's like they want the money of Chinese people but they don't want to respect Chinese people this movie doesn't tell a story that feels culturally Chinese it doesn't bridge any gaps of understanding between cultures it doesn't really make you interested in Chinese culture because like so many elements they presented were either oppressive or ugly you know some might argue that the cast was all Asian so it's fine but the cast usually actors usually don't have any input on the script. Actors are also contractually obligated to say nice things about the movie. I mean, it's great what this movie has done for Asian representation on the screen, but it, that doesn't mean that this movie should be immune from critique. It was a giant missed opportunity to do better. And Disney should do better. If it wants the money of Asian people, do better, Disney. Anyway, if you made it to the end of all of that, I, I bet you're bored just sitting at home in the quarantine. And and, uh, you know, who am I to critique Disney? Well, I am an actual Chinese person who spent half my life in China, and I know quite a bit about Chinese history, and I'm a sci-fi and fantasy author. My debut novel, Iron Widow, comes out fall 2021 from Penguin Random House, and it's a Pacific Rim meets The Handmaid's Tale retelling of China's only female emperor, Wu Zetian. Add it on Goodreads if you're interested, I'll drop a link below. Bye.